exercise is a man-made invention to supplement the fact that we're not using our human bodies the way that they've evolved to be, you mm -hmm. know? And that just, there's a lot of weight in that. It's like, you know, we, we go out and we do the thing that we're supposed to do because we're not living by our design. So, but it is also then kind of a bit odd that what we do is we then go move in these very sagittal plane, one motion dominant ways to say that this is how we're working our body out. One of the things that struck me um, when we met today in, in the real life for the first time, uh, gave each other a hug. I'm always like watching to see what people's gestures are. Are we like a fist bump or a handshake or a hug? Double cheek kiss, you know, you never know. Yep. Um, so we proceeded to hug, we made it to that level. And uh, you have a, a really um, beautiful suppleness to your spine and your ribs. I wasn't feeling excessively creepy, but I got enough of a feel that there was like a suppleness to your, uh, to your connective tissue. You're saying I'm like, I'm like a jello. I'm like a soft jelly. Yes. With bird bones. Yeah. Like a, like a, like a, like a handsome sea sponge. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know sea sponges? Apparently you can blend up a sea sponge and its cells will come back together and reemerge as a, like a central unit, a sea sponge. I did not, but that's, that's crazy. And I think I would do the same thing. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but well, look, look, I'm glad you brought, you brought the, uh, the hug thing up because I, I, I've always been a hugger. And one of the worst things about traveling around is you never know how to greet someone. You know, COVID aside, I'm talking pre pre-pandemic stuff you know you would travel to a, I would travel to these different countries and there's always that awkward like go for a handshake they go for a fist bump you like end up wrapping their hand or you go for a hug and they're like whoa we don't hug here yeah. so um, as soon as I see an opportunity for a hug man I'm what do you there. attribute your suppleness to because that's something that and I think it's an interesting thing that I notice I don't know if other people notice this type of thing but coming in contact like shaking someone's hand hugging someone you're gathering a ton of information about that person and that interaction mm -hmm. how hard do they shake do they have calloused hands where's mm -hmm. eye contact like you can feel a lot into the you can start to peel back the, the pages of a person's story just through coming into that that contact what do you attribute this this uh, suppleness that I detected in our in our embrace. You know, I, I right off the bat, I have to attribute it to the way in which I express and experience my vessel. You know, so the time that I spend in my body and the way in which I direct effort, uh, I think it comes out in how my tissues have rearranged and reestablished themselves over the past decade of me exploring more free motion. Hmm. What does that look like? What's your daily life look like? What are you eating? What's your exposure to the nature? What's your relationship to God? Let's talk about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what we're doing? We're jumping right in like that? What gets a body to be at that point? Because we have all these like dogmatic systems of like, this is the path, this is the thing. And then yeah. sometimes you meet a person, it's like, it seems like you're doing something right. Mm. And they don't necessarily have, you know, whatever thing to sell you or whatever the, you know, they're, they're, they're like the perfect nutritional regiment. Mm -hmm. But there's some people, that's typically been my tendency. When I find someone that seems like they're just like an effective biological organism, sentient being, whatever, like an effective human, they have like a light to them. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in how they do that. You know, do you, do you attribute, is there like a, uh, is it a movement thing? Is it a nutritional thing? Is it a, a, a mind thing? Is it a body thing? I, I would have to say that all those play factors, right? For, for each and every one of us. So for me, the, the schedule, the routines that I found that work really well for me have cultivated or have been designed over, you know, um, let me actually back up and just say, look, when, when I first got into fitness, I did the traditional route of bodybuilding and Olympic lifting and got into some sports specific training. And I really love that training. I love the way that it made me feel, but I eventually got to the point to where just intrinsically, intuitively, I felt like I was only expressing small parts of my human capacity, you know? Yeah. And so at that point, I just realized like, man, I'm, I'm living my entire life in these little boxed movements. There's got to be more. 
And, you know, I found myself in a place where most guys do, where I just wanted to be jacked and strong and, you know, lift the heaviest things I could. And then that stopped serving me as my body started sending me more and louder messages more frequently, you know, Hey dude, you got to change. Like something else is out there that will fulfill you in uh, many different ways. And that was my quest to begin movement. But also to and to go back to what you were asking earlier, it's not just the movement, right? It's it's everything else. So I, for me, it is nutrition. It's sleep. It's journaling. It's meditating. It's giving thanks. It's you know um, having relationships. It's all of those things play a factor into I believe how we hold tension in our body and where we hold tension at. Yeah. You know, so for me figuring out how to live more gracefully in my system and navigate the world more gracefully is a constant practice and it's something that I'm working towards every single day. What do you <clears throat> perceive tension in the body to be? Obviously, it's a lot of things. It's like asking what is pain? Obviously, it's, yeah. it's a highly nuanced conversation. Yeah. But I think there's a kind of a more like a, like a mechanistic kind of materialistic lens on what tension is in the body and it's more you know like engineering musculoskeletal mm -hmm. type lens and then there's maybe like a psycho-emotional lens and then maybe there's other lenses out there as well yeah. like how what's your relationship to tension in the body so my understanding of the body is that what's what's in the brain is in the body or in the mind is in the body what's in the body is in the mind and we we try to dissect them as if they're different, but they're the exact same thing, yeah. you know? And so that's why some therapeutic approaches are from, you know, top down or bottom up, you know, do we, do we look at more movement or do we look at how this person is working through psychological components, you know? And for me, it, it has to be this, this very, uh, holistic. And sometimes I kind of hate to use the word holistic, but this holistic approach of, you know, Yes, you can work out all the time. That's great if you can experience movement in, in all these different ways, and that's fantastic. But however you change your body, you're still, your brain, your mind, your psyche, all those things are still within your system. And if those things don't change, then you can work out to death. And it doesn't mean that you're going to find that thing that you're looking for. It doesn't mean that you'll find that suppleness, whether it be in the tissue or in the nervous system or in the way in which you navigate your day, yep. you know? So, um, for me, I can feel tension when I feel like there's something psychologically, uh, blocking or there's some sort of obstacle. I can always feel it in my body. When I say tension, I can feel almost like a tonicity, a tone or an electricity, and if I go out and I move and that's still there, then I go, okay, well, there's something else that I need to explore. Mm -hmm. You've, you're familiar with, with Vladimir Yonda's work, mm -hmm. I believe, mm -hmm. and his model of the body or one of his models of the body, he uh, refers to tonic and phasic muscles, yes. tonic muscles being kind of like the muscles that flex in the front, essentially pulling you into like a protective type position. And then the phasic would be the opposite side, the muscles that would pull you into extension and open you up. And the common tendency for people, at least in the culture that we're exposed to, is for those phasic muscles to be kind of flaccid and elongated. And those tonic flexor protective front facing muscles to be kind of overly contracted. Yes. <clears throat> I think it's an interesting thing to look at the different personality types um, and emotional states of individuals in re in relation to those postural archetypes because a person that feels I would I was just a person that feels totally safe confident loved supported like creative like they're like like living their what is that following their bliss Joseph mm -hmm. Campbell like they're in that place they're just like ah oh, like more life that person naturally is going to start to engage those muscles that would that would pull the body open sure and the person that's received the message at some point that the life, you know, close life out, life, the you know, world's not safe, then you'll have these, these tonic muscles start to engage and protect. It's very interesting. It a hundred percent is. And you know, yes, I, I definitely see emotion popping up in posture all of the time, but also, you know, just look at everyone's day to day life. Like everything that we do pulls us into more of these flexed postures. 
And then our body adapts. You know, our bodies are these incredible adaptation machines. So given the opportunity, they'll figure out ways to expend less energy and figure out ways to take away things that you aren't using. And part of that is getting stuck in posture. And then, like you said, those postures can then affect the emotional state. So maybe, you know, it's the chicken or the egg scenario, yep. right? So maybe we spend so much time looking at our phones, looking at our computer in seated postures to where now everything that has adapted has adapted to that protective, oh no, I'm not safe. And then we get those signals that just cycle through on loop. Yeah. And then uh, we, we just did record an episode with Ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy. Mm -hmm. And in that conversation, one of the things we kind of stumbled into is it's interesting that so much of his work is around all of the kind of like shadow nooks and crannies of the body that people aren't, you know, largely popular culture isn't really paying attention to. And then his big thing is like walking backwards. He's like, I've pulled a sled backwards more than anybody. You know, I'm like, what, Love an, that. what an interesting personality um, or an indication of a person's personality or the way that they, they think or perceive things to suddenly be called to go backwards. And I think that's an interesting relationship to your work as well. And a lot of what I'm really enamored by, which is spending time on the ground and how we've kind of divorced ourselves from that relationship. And it seems we were talking about this before, like I feel almost like an asshole even talking about it because it seems so simple and like almost like trite, you know, but that relationship, it's, it's a, it's a fundamental, it's like a teacher that preps the body for all the functional ranges of, of motions that are necessary for life. And if you spend too much time missing those ranges of motion, so you might miss out on you know, maybe the toe hinge or the ankle mm -hmm. range of motion or, you know, any of that, then suddenly there's a limitation in the way that you move through the world and a way to heal some of those standing postures is actually from returning back to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, uh, I love this line and I, I don't remember where I heard it from first. And, and this is just an iteration. It may have been Dr. Spina since we mentioned him earlier, but it's, you know, Exercise is a man-made invention to supplement the fact that we're not using our human bodies the way that they've evolved to be, you know? And that just, there's a lot of weight in that. It's like, you know, we, we go out and we do the thing that we're supposed to do because we're not living by our design. So, but it is also then kind of a bit odd that what we do is we then go move in these very sagittal plane one motion dominant ways to say that this is how we're working our body out you know versus uh what you alluded to earlier when we were talking uh these different archetypal postures of floor sitting in different ways you know of being able to roll over going back to some of those neurodevelopmental stages and positions postures because you know the the interesting thing is all of that time that we spent on the floor during our developmental stages gave us all these building blocks and tools for us to become these upright bipedal human beings. The unfortunate part is most people think like, oh, I, I've already got all the stuff, you know, I don't need to go back to where I learned it. And that's truly unfortunate. And that's why I've seen people uh, have different relationships with the ground. Some people, when they get on it, they're like, oh, I'm home. I love this. This feels great to me. Other people, when they get on it, they almost seem scared. They seem frightened. They, it seems so foreign to them. Hmm. I, th I think that person that would have some like an intimidation or maybe like just like a foreign relationship with the ground would also probably have a foreign relationship with um, being like a child, being playful, mm -hmm. you know, or like that. I think that's an interesting thing to see when someone's like really an adult, like there, there's no kid Left, left in the person, you know, like I, I know lots of people that are in their eighties that are more childish than anybody I know in their thirties, you know? So uh, when a person that's really like in that adult suit, when they're around a little kid that has all this imagination and wonderment and play and make believe the adults are like really uncomfortable mm -hmm. from like, uh, 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 huh? Like, do I pet it? Yeah, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? You're like on the ground, you're playing with trucks and rocks and, uh, you know, it's just like, okay, I'm going to go do some TPS reports, yeah. you know, or lift some dumbbells or something sick. But so I, I think it's like, 
so I think that the play is a massive element to that. And, and the ground naturally kind of catalyzes, um, I don't know, this like this, the spontaneity of play, like play emerges through doing something as foreign as being on the ground for an adult. And I'll shut up in a second. The last thing I want to say in relation to this, I think that the ground acts uh, essentially like refining what I was saying before. It acts as like a tuning mechanism for the body. Yeah. I'm borrowing that from a guy called Philip Beach. I think you're familiar with Philip Beach as well. That's so funny you brought him up. I was going to actually mention Philip Beach. Yeah, so he yeah. calls, he calls. I reference him in my, my book. Um, and he calls these ground poses that I kind of break down, you know, a variety in, in mine. And you do it in your work as well. He calls them postural archetypal postures of repose mm -hmm. and that's the thing it's like your body is an instrument you don't tune an instrument you know on february 2nd 1985 and then you're like cool we're good yeah you tune it after playing with regularity and that's what i would suggest spending time on the ground is it acts as a, a natural tuning mechanism for the body a hundred percent and you know i had this really great experience with philip i was uh, living in New Zealand for a very short amount of time and I was speaking to a couple of other animal flow instructors about uh, Muscles and Meridians, his book, and they said, you know, he lives here in town and mm. I did not know that. And the next day we met up and, you know, went hiking through the woods barefoot for two hours and then he brought me back and did a little work on me. He is just a brilliant guy and I love that analogy of tuning the body by uh, using floor contact. Mm. And he also has a lot of other cool things like, you know, different ways in which you can uh, express more motion throughout the day uh, in the house and the way that the house is designed. Yeah. Yeah. That gets into um, systems theory or like a systems theory based approach to the body and like what the hell is going on here with like the whole chicken or the egg from a systems lens the body is a self-organizing system and it organizes around it, the, its environment mm. so we think we have all this control it's like oh it's a central nervous system or it's like a musculoskeletal thing or it's this you know we have all these stories but in fact we're continually just responding to our environmental conditions and we're like we're we're inextricably fit to the environment so you could also go in and change your environment and then that would trickle into the way that you show up as a person right because i think people discount to your point i think people discount all of the hours that they're spending not working out and what they're doing in those hours exactly you know so it's one thing to go like oh i'm gonna go to the gym and i'm gonna work on this i'm gonna do this for my posture i'm gonna do this and you know um, but then I'm going to go spend all the rest of my waking hours in this position or I'm going to sleep in this way. And so I think that's it's like people don't even realize that that is a much bigger percentage of their overall human experience than the time that they spend in the gym or with an osteo or with, you know, a massage therapist or whatever it may be. Yeah. You know, those things are fantastic, but you still have to look at the environment. Yeah. Or or think in this way or breathe in this way. Mm hmm. You know, as far as what we're doing in day-to-day -day life, what is your, what's the, the habitat of your mind like throughout the day? Like, what's your relationship to your thoughts? What is the habitat of my mind like? I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> how much time do we have? Yeah. Don't we have a flight to catch? Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, son of a bitch, I gotta get on a goddamn plane here in two hours or something. We gotta do this again. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have to tell you, I mean, one of the things that w really works for me is, well, I always use this line, uh, structure gives us freedom. And so for me, having a very structured day really helps me feel like I'm enjoying that day. And some people think like, oh, structure, that's boring. That's like, you know, that's lame. But I'm like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm utilizing every minute of every day doing the things that I love to do. And some of that is work. But I start my day, typically I get up at around 3.30 a.m. And then from there I, you know, jump into some journaling or I'll start working on some of the bigger projects of the day. Then I train for the first time that day. And then from there it's, I just have this like very almost to the minute schedule all the way up until I go to bed at 8.30 at night. Wow. Yeah. You're one of those people. Yeah. Oh yeah. Damn. Yeah. You wouldn't want to date me. No. no. Well, I mean, since that <laughs> hug, I was thinking about it, but now it's off. That's, has that always been the case? Man, it, it mostly has. I've always, I've, I've fought it for many years. I just thought like only crazy people wake up at 3.30 in the morning. And 
I honestly think it was from when I was working as a trainer in New York City when I was 19 years old. I would have to get up at 3.30, take three trains to get to the gym for a 5.15 a.m. client. And I, I honestly believe that my clock was just set. And mm -hmm. it's just, it worked for me then. It works for me now. Uh, for the years I tried to fight it, it didn't work for me. So yeah. I have a buddy called uh, Dr. Michael Bruce, and he has a whole like breakdown of different. I don't know. It's he it doesn't. It's it's something kind of like chronotype, but it's not chronotype. Um, but different people, their you know their physiology is structured so that they just naturally tend to go to sleep earlier. And is this like, like the wolf and the? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know what it's called exactly. I don't know what the function of that is, or what, you know, if it's nature or nurture, or whatever it is. But he's got like a whole breakdown in his book. Dr. Mm -hmm. Michael Bruce has the thing. I'm not. I'm not that. I'm envious of the people that have that because it seems like you're way more productive than us late night turds, just YouTube and. <laughs> Well, listen, man, I can tell you that <laughs> my value significantly drops off at like 3 p.m. So because I mean, oh. at that point, you know, now it's like 12 hours from the time that I actually got out of bed. So at th 3 p.m. on, I'm basically a zombie. Yeah. Like I put out no good work. I was reading a thing before this. I was reading all about um, childhood developmental patterns. And one of the things that was interesting that uh, that stuck out was um, the value of a, a baby being on their belly, you call it tummy time. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that tummy time allows for a child is for those posterior muscles, the cervical spine and thoracic spine, just the whole back to start to engage. So those, those phasic muscles, to use Yonda's, Yonda's language, start to come online because the baby naturally has to pull itself up off of the ground. And then it Oh, it reaches back around and looks over here and, oh, and then it starts maybe reaching and then it's it starts to go through this whole sequence of what we'd call developmental patterns and then the transition into modernity <clears throat> which is, looks a lot like adults as well is a transition into always being in a cart you know and learning that you got to sleep on your back and uh, kind of just having this much more front-facing or supine kind of you're like perpetuating the fetal stage mm. in a way but by allowing the child to, to start to, to go through those patterns, they start to engage the body in like a really like a strong, stable, supported, structural way. And if we bypass that, then the body, it kind of jumps a stage in a way. Yeah. And I think that relates to adults as well. I couldn't agree more. So when we're, when, if, when we're looking at baby developing, you know, like you mentioned, belly time, learning to press up and look around all these things are because baby wants to acquire things right wants yep. to see what's going on wants to get to the toy wants to get to the shiny object that's the systems theory lens right right so it's just forming to the environment Ugh, food yeah water, i want that boom. i got to get over there ah. exactly so now i have to learn to roll over <laughs> now i have to learn to press up now i have to learn to creep and crawl and i'm not thinking about how i do this no I have this extrinsic motivation. I'm just like, I want the thing. There's no vastus lateralis <laughs> VMO soleus. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the cool thing about that is like, yes, all those geeky things are happening. So the nervous system is speaking to the tissues that will eventually stabilize the joint and will eventually create dynamic motion. And yeah, those things are happening, but baby's not thinking about that you know mm -hmm. baby just wants things i love that this podcast is officially called baby's not thinking about that baby's not thinking about that baby's not thinking about that ba oh, baby wants that. to get bottled what a t-shirt <laughs> that's good uh but yeah so and, and but it's not just the body stuff it's the brain as well so it's you know um you know even just looking off into the distance and back of the hands binocular vision is going to be super helpful for hand-eye coordination there's cognitive processes that are being amplified you know they're going to be important for comprehension concentration and memory you know all those things are happening and the the thing that was really cool that okay let me let me back up and start that again um whenever i was starting to spend more floor time not belly time but floor time tell for me, myself tell me, tell me, tell me time, time we call it tell me it, time tell me time we call it yeah i knew i was yeah. gonna mess that up maternal, um, in the maternal space the more ground time that i was experiencing i i i started having like this this whole this whole new wave of sensations and and I started noticing that just like you know the way in which I experienced my body was different but also the way in which I experienced my brain my mind was different and anecdotally 
as I started teaching animal flow to other people, they started coming back and saying some similar things. They're like, look, I don't know if this has anything to do with it. Probably not. But I feel like maybe like I have better concentration or maybe I feel like my memory's a little bit better. And I'm not saying animal flow is the key. I'm saying that they did do a research or they did a study, excuse me, in 2016 where they took a group of participants and they used animal flow, but they just called it novel quadrupedal movement. And they put them through four weeks. I think they trained three times a week for an hour and just in a month, noticeable increases in markers of cognition in mm -hmm. one month, just moving novel quadrupedal movements. And um, so, yeah, I think people also maybe uh, don't value the process of getting on the ground to not only work their body, but also their brain. What would you attribute that to the, the cognitive effect of going through these novel quadrupedal movements? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know that I could explain that because I, 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 that's not my, uh, my expertise. Yeah. So for me to say like, this is exactly what happens in the brain, I would be totally making it up. I think, I think it's interesting. So there is, there seems to be from what I've, I've read, this is absolutely not my zone of, of expertise either, but there seems to be consistency with physical development and cognitive development and emotional development and adaptive in all of these different realms of development of a human. And I think it comes back to a similar thing of like the chicken or the egg ultimately we move our, our brain exists for us to move everything that we do, whether it's eating, whether it's communicating, whether it's, you know, anything is some form of movement. Mm -hmm. And as a person becomes more effective at those, those kind of like baseline ranges of motion, you're able to go through your full functional range of motion of all the joints in your body, including your facial gestures, mm -hmm. you know, that opens up the, the base or the foundation or like the, like the trunk of the tree, to be able to express and to be able to lift weight and be able to support and be able to be a supportive friend and be able to communicate with confidence and know that you're safe inside of your body, which now we start, we send this new, you know, opens up these new potentials of just feeling like a more secure, well inhabited, balanced, flexible, sort like all of that. It's, it's one integrated system. So I think it all feeds back off of each other. The exact, whether it's like hemispheres or integrated right. or something mm -hmm. like that. Cross lateral motion for left and right hemisphere communication. Yeah, I don't but, know. But but I think that just in, intuitively and logically, it all feeds off to each other. Mm -hmm. You're a better mover. You you show up in a more effective way in life, which opens you up to more of life. A hundred percent. Yes. And also, you know, to, to kind of echo that and piggyback on it a little bit. When we stop learning, then there's a sense of stagnation, right? So our ability to learn lessons, you know, as we begin to explore new things, whether it be quadrupedal movement, it'd be dance, it'd be learning uh, an instrument, it'd be learning how to, to draw, like just the process of going through learning, that is, has, that takes cognitive energy. So the better that we get at learning new things, then the better we'll get at learning new things and continue to keep our brain working. You know, so I, that always goes back to the, um, you know, getting really comfortable at being uncomfortable mm -hmm. because, you know, we're as human beings, we have the tendency to go towards the things that make us feel safe and comfortable. You know, yep. I always exercise the same way. I always do this. We're creatures of habit. Uh, when we go and we expose ourselves to something completely new that we're not inherently good at, that you know maybe we were, were worried about other people seeing us not be good at this thing, it is quite uncomfortable. But the more we do that, the more conditioned we get to being uncomfortable, and that's when we're forcing the body to change. Hmm. You know, that's where we get adaptation. When we're just doing the same shit over and over again, then there's no reason. You know, our body wants to conserve energy. Our brain wants to conserve energy. Yeah. So that's why just trying new stuff, no matter what it is, is, I mean, to be a lifelong uh, explorer in that way of always trying new things and allowing yourself to be shit at them. Yeah. It feels like we can almost Im imprison ourselves within our strengths in a way. Yes. <laughs> I'm nodding very enthusiastically. Yes. You know? Yeah. And, and why not? Right? Because it's comfortable. It's, it's like, yeah, I'm good at this thing. So I'm going to really lean into this thing. Mm -hmm. And then within that, you can get so strong in that one pattern, you become overdeveloped or, or compensated that suddenly 
the the chasm between or gap between you and your your perceived weaknesses just gets bigger and bigger until eventually they become like this shadow space right yeah the deficit just like oh i don't want to go into the shadow right it's scarier now right it's been so long since i've been there and that can show up in every way right that can show up in in movement exercise but also in conversation and the way in which we you know navigate relationships like yeah yeah like how you do anything is how you do everything i think is a relevant thing yeah how does a person start to engage with their their shadow in the form and that's that sounds like some new age woo -woo stuff but carl jung was pretty smart you know that was the language (laughs) that he used so there um so how does a person go explore their own shadow from a a physical lens or, or become excited and engaged with that you know like like i have some friends that have a company called seek discomfort which i really like mm, nice you know their, their, their youtube channel is called yes theory which is very you know they do all sorts of stuff and it's all about just seeking discomfort in various different ways and like that's their motto that's their their, their like mantra for life how does a person start to engage that mindset from a physical perspective because i think obviously it trickles into everything else mm-hmm Yeah, you know, and so uh, last year we put out this little mini documentary that's just called We Invite You to Move. And essentially what we're asking people to do is is just to try anything. You know, and this this whole project started off as we were going to make a mini documentary on the creation of Animal Flow and like how it came about. And then through the process, I started interviewing other people that had different um, disciplines. So like, you know, a guy who's a b-boy another type of dance a parkour athlete and as i was because a lot of those things influenced me as i was i started working with animal flow uh or with the animal flow concepts and what i realized through that process is that to tell a story about me felt very self-serving the real story there was the passion that they that just 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 radiated from them when they talked about the thing that they love so much. Mm -hmm. And that was the story that I wanted to tell. It's like, how do you find the thing that inspires you to be better in all ways? And so for them, it was, you know, parkour or breakdancing or whatever. But there are so many people out there who are moving, but maybe they're stuck in that one way of moving. Or there are a lot more people who are not doing anything. So instead of preaching to the choir and saying, yeah, maybe try new things. It's like, how do we reach the person who's too scared to even begin? You know, and I think that message of just try anything is pretty solid because, you know, you may have to go through a lot of things that you definitely don't like before you find the one thing that you're like, you know what, I'm not good at this thing, but I want to come back, you know, and that's going to be different for every single person. So whatever drives them to that, um, it's going to be so, you know such an individual thing, but you know when we're talking about flow, finding more flow in your life, you have to first find the things that take you out of flow. So what are the things that are roadblocks? What are the things that you see as obstacles that keep coming up and presenting themselves? And I think once you can identify those things, then you can start working on mitigating how fluid you can navigate a day based on starting to work on the things that are are blaringly uh, you know, are blaring obstacles that you need to overcome. And so whenever we're looking at someone who's afraid to start moving, it's like, you know, why, you know, where's the fear come from? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of, of not looking cool in the gym? Are you afraid of getting laughed at? Are you afraid that, that you'll have change and a new life will come? You know, are you, are, are you stuck in this space where you're just so used to, um, being stagnant? Yeah. You know, and some people get addicted to the pain, if you will. What do you think of kind of like rehab as kind of like supplemental isolated exercises doing like rotator cuff band work or doing like very specific, you know, site specific exercises um, compared to going through something that's that's more of like a dynamic, like animal flow type mm-hmm. movement? I think I think everything has its place. And for me, depending upon the person who I'm working with or the person that, I, uh, that I'm training, 
some of those very specific things like rehab or mobilizations or whatever they are, uh, they can be necessary for that body's experience, but there always has to be an integration or a reintegration process. So I think, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I think when someone has this one tool and they're maybe they're corrective exercise only, and that's all they can see and they go, oh, well, this person can't do a dynamic movement until we fix that hip, fix that knee. And that can become problematic unless the, the end goal and the intent is to eventually get them to the point to where they can move freely in all ways. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think that that's a, a very common trend. It's been the case for, I don't know, maybe me in some stages of my life, but you become like a gym athlete. Like that's your sport is, is being at the gym, which is great as long as that's, that's your intention, that's what you're into. But I, I think coming back to those develop mental patterns using that that language or that that lens looking at like being able to walk effectively is a big deal being able to to run being able to maybe throw something every now and again being able to jump being able to i don't know dribble a basketball like all of these core like highly complex coordinated movements where the whole symphony has to come online um pretty like it I, I feel like we could, we would live a good life if we just kind of steeped ourselves in that, that space. Like that was, that was the intention is to integrate the system into these archetypal movements that, you know, we'd express in our daily lives. But we've kind of, as a culture, I think drifted away from those. Yeah. Which is pretty interesting. It's super interesting. And it's <laughs> like, how did that happen? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, uh, you know. Convenience, technology, I mean, there are so many things, right? But, you know, the, the thing that, that really, really resonated with me was the idea of to train to last. So am I training today for how I want to look uh, with my shirt off on Instagram tomorrow? Or am I training in a way that will hopefully allow me the, the freedom to enjoy my body longer? You know, because let's say when we turn 70, 80, 90 years old, we may no longer be into Olympic lifting or HIIT training or whatever, but we're still going to be in our body. And the way in which we treated our body throughout those years will dictate how we experience it later. Mm. You know, and I, th I think that's such an important message for people to really wrap their head around because, you know, we're in such a, our society is at such a phase right now where everything is immediate gratification. You know, everything is like, I do this because I want this other thing right fucking now. Yeah. You know, versus I'm, I'm playing the long game. You know, I want to enjoy this thing forever because that's all we got. It's all we got. Every other possession that we have comes and goes, but the only thing that we will definitely have for hundred percent of our life is our body. Yeah. We need to do this again. I have a God dang flight tonight. And we, so for people listening, we recorded a bunch of, uh, went through a really rad movement flow for the YouTube. What are we doing that? Can you describe what we did in that? Yeah, we did a, a beast activation, a beast and crab activation, yeah. which we, we look as just a primer for the body. Yeah. Uh, and then we also did a crab reach and a scorpion reach, which are full body mobilizing movements. Yeah. Why do those movements matter? So when we're looking at variety, variability, you know, we talked earlier about how when people experience these same movement patterns over and over again, everything adapts to it. So connective tissue, joints, nervous system, you know, everything adapts. Diaphragm, the way we breathe, yeah. the way we experience life. So the more variety variability, especially when we're looking at load variability, the more that we can get different sensations into our tissues and joints and receptors, um, the more that adaptation process can give us a better 3D map of our body and of our body in the brain. Mm. So some of those movements that I brought you through, uh, you know, we're, we're experiencing ranges that are under load. And when I say load, it's gravity in our body weight. It's that load that we're expressing those or experiencing those, those loads at very unique angles within the joints that you typically wouldn't experience in loaded training or, you know, doing traditional gym exercises. So just getting into those different areas and different ranges and exploring them and shedding some light on some of those shadow areas that you were talking about earlier, incredibly important. But also in the activations, we're inviting people back into their body consciously, which is a huge thing. 
So, you know, we have so many things competing for our attention on a day to day basis. So to actually get someone to where they can't think about anything else but what they're doing physically, that's a big shift. You know, and it takes a lot to do that because someone can still deadlift and think about, you know, their relationship. Someone can run on a treadmill and think about everything else that's going on in the world. But when you have them focus, laser focus on something that their body is trying to maneuver or this movement puzzle they're trying to figure out, then nothing else matters. They're 100 percent aware. They're there. So we're inviting them consciously into their body. And then we're also just uh, encouraging the body to speak to itself. So again, I mentioned those little receptors. I I like to call them satellites. And those little satellites that we have all through our body um, stimulate with load. And so by having hands and feet in contact with the ground and moving around, we're experiencing a wide variety of load. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd highly, highly recommend people jump over and check out that video. Um, it'll be called, I don't know, something animal flow, yeah. Fitch, aligned podcast, whatever. Um, that'll be released on the day that this is released. And then, um, I couldn't recommend checking out your animal flow, animal flow stuff as a whole more. I think it's a really important aspect of the whole movement conversation. Um, where's the best place for people to go to learn more? Uh, animalflow.com. Right. Uh, yep. Website. And then just animal flow official on IG. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. And then we will also be doing, we'll release a Instagram video going through three locomotion patterns. The ABCs. Really, the ABCs. So check that out. I think that this, it would be a disservice for this conversation to just be audio. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really important to encapsulate the movement into it as well. So the IG has the ABCs. YouTube has the, the fundamental kind of, yep. I don't know what you'd call it. What would you, what would you call that if we had to put a name on that? Uh, we could just call it a, a warm up, a great prime. We could call it a primer. Primer. That's right. <laughs> Animal flow primer. All right. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate getting to make this happen with you. And uh, we definitely got to do it again. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. That's it. Thank That's you. all. Over now.